that, we're back. We're live. Here we are at 3 o'clock block with Marco Mangelsdorf doing Global Connections and talking about China. And the, the title of our show is very provocative, but true is, um, you know, Hong Kong now and Taiwan next. There's a sequence going on. Do you agree, Marco? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, I feel a little bit uh, disoriented because it's a different day and a different time and a different subject. But, you know, this allows me to put on my PhD political science hat and the fact that my principal field in poli sci was international relations. So this is a real pleasure to kind of put the solar hat down, the energy hat down and talk about things uh, thousands of miles away, you know, in a global context for the part of the world that I've taken a very keen interest in, I would say over the past 20 years or so, and spent a fair amount of time in the People's Republic in Taiwan, Southeast Asia and so forth. So thank you so much for having me. Sure, sure. And, and it's very interesting you should mention that because what I was gonna say in the days of Deng Xiaoping and the days of say around the, the year 2000, China was so promising. There were so many Americans, including young Americans who had the greatest hopes. There were organizations built to ultimately, you know, connect up with China and do stuff together with China. And uh, we were going to have a new day. It was going to be a fabulous time going forward. I remember the energy of it. Uh, and I remember how excited I was about it. But if you go fast forward from the early 2000s till now, wow, things have really changed. You know, I, I, um, uh, I, I, I um, read a book called uh, Pacific um, by uh, Simon Winchester out of the East West Center. And it had various stories about various parts and countries in the Pacific. And uh, one of the stories was China and the South China Sea. And, and he talked, this is at least 10 years ago. It was a revelation for me. He talked about um, the fact that China was going to take over that area, that it had determined to take over that area, uh, the ocean and everything in sight. And um, it had you know, imperialistic plans. And uh, the question, of course, was then and is now, is what can we do about it? Can we do anything about it? Uh, or, or is this a sort of, um, you know, baked into the future? Is this a, a, you know, a future that we have to, we have to sit back and enjoy because we're not going to be as influential as we were in, in the Western Pacific? And I remember how shocked I was with that, shocked with the notion of the great, uh, exceptional United States, the winner of World War II, um, the greatest generation, how we had to sit back and take it. And that, um, you know, Simon Winchester was saying, relax, we, we, don't, we don't have the ability to remain as influential as we used to be. At first, I, re I resisted that notion. But then after a while, I saw that he was right. And that's the last 10 years of my thinking about China, watching our relationship with them devolve and watching their care and concern about mm, um, accommodating us also devolve. You've seen the same thing. I have, and there's so many entry points that we have here, Jay. We could have a multi-hour seminar uh, easily without running out of interesting things to talk about. And, and for me, you know, I've, I've, I consider myself something of a scholar of uh, post-revolution. Uh, in other words, uh, since October 1949 to the present uh, Chinese political history. And it's, it's a fascinating tale on so many different levels. And you know, you go to the back of uh, you go back to 1976 and the death of Mao Zedong, and then the rise of uh, the oft uh, sent off to the hinterlands, hinterlands by Mao, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who became kind of uh, first among equals in '79. And one of the lessons from uh, from Mao, I believe, that was learned uh, within China was uh, the danger of having a particular individual and his cohort having so much power. And they decided consciously to go in a more collective leadership direction. And that was the situation for a number of decades. You know, had the, uh, the 1989 uh, phenomenon, which wasn't just Tiananmen Square in June, which, you know, we're coming up on what well, we just passed about 32 years ago. Uh, but I mean, that, that was uh, months and months in the making of uh, demonstrations uh, by 
by educated youth and in, in not just Beijing, but multiple Chinese cities across the mainland uh, who are unhappy with the current trajectory, unhappy with corruption, unhappy with uh, the Communist Party leadership. And then you had uh, with the fall of, uh, of the Democrats, so to speak, you had Jiang Zemin, who became the leader of the party for over 10 years, and then Hu Jintao uh, for 10 years. And that was kind of the informal understanding, wasn't in the constitution, wasn't under statute to my understanding, but you had a leader that served two terms and then left. And with Xi Jinping coming into the leadership position in 2012, uh, interestingly, there were a lot of hopes pinned on this fellow who had a nice warm smile, who had spent time in the United States. Maybe he was going to be the great liberalizer or a uh, small D Democrat that we were hoping and, and aspiring that he would become. He would continue to open up the People's Republic of China, maybe liberalize as time went by. And I think by all accounts, uh, any reasonable observer would say he's gone in the opposite direction. And now there's a big question, uh, or maybe it's not even a question, that he is the he is the core leader. That's the way he's referred to in, in China. And the notion that he's going to step down anytime soon uh, is not in the cards from what we all can tell. So he appears to be leader for life, another Mao who ruled from 1949 to 1976 when he died. And one of the biggest concerns I have, Jay, and I've been taking a pretty deep dive over the past just few months in terms of reading books that uh, talk about, have, have talked about the Cultural Revolution and the upheavals that took place uh, from 1966 to 76 uh, under, under Mao, is that when you look back at periods like that, and even under Xi Jinping, you had uh, the not infrequent occurrence of top party leaders who were touted to be very close to Mao, who were touted to be the person to come after Mao, people like uh, Liu Xiaoqi and Lin Biao uh, under Mao, who from one day to the next uh, either were banned as counter-revolutionaries, revisionists, or in the case of Lin Biao, he apparently was trying to escape to the Soviet Union and his plane crashed. So you have this history, uh, whether it's under Mao and now under Xi, early on in the Xi years, of big party heavyweights such as Yo Zhong Kong, or Bo Xi Lai, who both met rather unpleasant fates. Now they weren't pottered off and executed or dismembered, but they were both uh, big show trials and imprisoned. So she has made it a point of, of putting people away who he sees as a threat. And to go to my punchline here, Jay, one of my biggest concerns is as US Chinese relations are at a, a nadir, we're at a real low point now. And not only between ourselves and the People's Republic of China, but whether it's the European Union, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, India, Japan, that there are multiple, and parts of Southeast Asia as well, there are multiple parts of this world which have become increasingly uncomfortable uh, to what, this, what, what we see China doing both internally and externally. So here, my punchline is, I, I'm concerned about to what extent Somebody like Xi Jinping, who's leader of the party, who is head of the military commission, they're a very powerful position in and of itself, is having any type of counsel around him, which is challenging the, the, the existing orthodoxy, which is giving him counter arguments and, 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 a, and a spirited discussion about what's going on, kind of a red team, so to speak, no pun intended. And I think back to, to jo, jo, John F. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, October 62, and the XCOM, the executive committee, where there were multiple voices advocating different paths, whether it's the, the general chiefs of staff, whether it was Bobby Kennedy or the attorney general, you had an open discussion about options and costs for those options. And to what extent in, in the top echelon of the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee and the Politburo, there is open discussion about the risks that China, Beijing and its current trajectory are, are, are encountering or will, will, will encourage. Uh, that is one of my biggest concerns, that he's operating in perhaps something of a bubble that doesn't allow the free flow and discussion of information 
that would challenge the particular worldview right now that's being held at the top level of the Communist Party? Well, just as um, you know, he's uh, been very hard on his own people. A lot of people have you know left or tried to leave China. A lot of them have gone to retraining camps. Uh, that that uh, that that buzz of um, optimism is is has been modified. Um, and uh, look at the uh, really harsh steps he's taken uh, to to Hong Kong, and look at the rhetoric he's been using on Taiwan lately. It's it's scary, and um, it, it seems to me that in the last ten years, as you say, uh, she has taken more power every time you look. He's uh, he treats himself as Mao. Uh, he he treats his writings and his his comments, his thinking as uh, as as thoughts of Mao. Um, and I agree with you, he'll stay in power a long time. So the question really is, um, and you talk about all these countries that are mm, intimidated uh, for good reason, for good reason. It's not just economic, it's, it, there's, there's military behind that. I mean, they got the biggest Navy in the world now, they have the nuclear weapons. Um, they are, um, and the army, I don't know, <laughs> the army is huge. Um, and, 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 and obedient. And so I think what we have is a real threat to Southeast Asia and to any country that gets in the way, including all the countries that want to use those ocean pathways uh, that he has effectively taken over, um, you know, in violation of the, of, the, of, the, of the International Court in Hague. So, so you know, it, it, the real question is, where is this going? It's not likely uh, that he's going to have the red team anytime soon, Marco. Um, he's going to stay there in power. He's going to be increasingly paranoid. Um, absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. That's what we have. Uh, one belt, one road, or shall I say belt and road, um, you know, will we'll give him power and influence and God knows what kind of leverage all the way to Europe, all the way to Europe in every which way. I mean, he's building Chinese freeways through countries that, you know, don't have drinking water. Um, it, it's quite remarkable what he's been doing, and this is going to give him control in so many ways of the economics and, and ultimately the political, uh, the political, uh, political sovereignty of those countries. So what, what, I, what I would like to ask you, if you have all those considerations, what's, what's going to happen here? He's not going to be less powerful next year. He's going to be more powerful. Uh, we don't have to get to the question of the U.S. just yet, but we got to talk about that. So let's talk about, you know, Asia. Let's talk about going west all the way to Europe. Where is she taking us? Well, and uh, unless he were to make a major misstep, which is, is not predictable at this point or uh, when, if, where, but I mean, if he were to make a major misstep, that would most likely put his leadership in, in serious jeopardy, although so much of what going, goes on at the very top echelon of the Chinese Communist Party is so very opaque. Uh, so the likelihood of that happening, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to bet one way or the other. But, you know, to address your question, Jay, to me, my focus, my focus is particularly on the Republic of China, a.k.a. Taiwan, which is off of the. Chinese uh, East Coast, the mainland East Coast. And I've been paying particular close attention these past months in the past year or two, especially in light of what appears to me not being a lawyer, but appears to me to be a clear abrogation of Beijing's agreement with, with the UK in 1997 to hand over Hong Kong, right? 50 years of autonomy. I think any, any reasonable observer, any reasonable scholar, any reasonable lawyer would see what's happened there and see it as an abrogation of the agreement that the, the Beijing and London came to in 1997. So a very cautionary tale in terms of uh, clearly Xi Jinping and the leadership saw Hong Kong, the continuing, shall we say, unrest in Hong Kong as being unsustainable from their perspective and, and absolutely uh, not, within, not, not acceptable. So they've taken the action that they have, people like Jimmy Lai, Martin Lee and others who have been, uh, you know, for decades uh, on the side of uh, Hong Kong Democrats are either in prison or have been uh, reprimanded severely that they're not likely to get in, involved in politics anymore. So what does this mean for that region, for that neighborhood? And if you look at 
kind of the last remaining sore spot for Beijing. This goes back, of course, even prior to the October 49 revolution, but it goes back to the decades long civil war between the Communist Party and the Kuomintang, right? Led under Chiang Kai shek decades ago. So Taiwan is the last remaining unfinished business of the People's Republic of China. And it has been a- Are, are you saying that Hong Kong is already handled? And that oh, yeah. Hong, Kong, Hong, oh, yeah. Hong Kong is over the of the Rubicon now and it's not coming back? No, That's what, no. Yeah. I don't see any circumstances whatsoever where there would be, I mean, in, 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 in the world as we have right now, uh, where Hong Kong would revert back or would go back to a more democratic uh, set of violence there. I, I, I see no possibility of that happening. So the last remaining big part of their, uh, their portfolio in terms of things they absolutely feel they need to do, I'm talking about the, the leadership in, in Beijing, is to deal with the Taiwan issue. And like I said, it's been bothering them for decades and decades and decades. And I am very concerned, Jay, and a lot of people who pay close attention to, to that part of the world are very, very concerned that uh, there is a, the, the tension between uh, the Taiwanese government under uh, Tsai Ing-wen and, and her Democratic Progressive Party and, and, uh, and Beijing and the tension between the United States, between China and the United States, but not just between China and the United States regarding Taiwan, but uh, the Europeans are getting involved as well. And the Chinese are particularly apoplectic about what they call salami cutting or salami slicing tactics. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that over the decades, roughly since I think it was Jimmy Carter who after Deng Xiaoping visited the US for the first time, first and only time in 1979, decided to officially change our recognition of China from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. Uh, there has been this so-called strategic ambiguity in Washington from Democrat to Republican to a Democrat Republican president, where it was kind of an open question. Well, what if what, what, if what happens uh, in Taiwan in terms of the Chinese mainland folks uh, uh, seeking to reunite the motherland with Taiwan uh, by force, what would we do? What would the United States do? Hence the, well, we wanna leave it ambiguous, right? So it's been ambiguous for decades, but it's kind of less ambiguous now. So from Beijing's perspective, Jay and I, I read the Chinese press every single day, which uh, their, their MO typically alternates between defense and offense and offense and defense, constant, constant, constant in terms of going after their critics, going after the United States, going after Scott Morrison, who's the PM in Australia, and the list goes on and on and on. The, the salami chasing, the salami slicing, uh, to use their, the Chinese vernacular is essentially, we just keep on pushing closer, pushing closer, pushing closer to this red line, this core interest where Beijing is absolutely set and makes very clear that this is not negotiable. This is not negotiable. We will, re we will reunify Taiwan with the mainland. It's just a question of when, and we're, we're running out of patience. We're running out of patience with the current government in Taiwan. We're running out of patience with the Americans. And there have been record numbers of, uh, of Chinese aircraft that have tested the air defense zone and ID zone around Taiwan. And a big, big concern about, you know, what, what comes next and all the, 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 the war playing scenarios that I'm aware of that have been conducted by the Pentagon or by other groups in the United States, you know, show uh, few, if any, scenarios where, where our side wins or where the Taiwanese win. So it's, it, it's a very, very, very serious concern. And I mean, this is an island of uh, close to 24 million, of which about less than a million are expats. So figure on 23 or so million uh, native uh, Chinese to the island and, and, and ethnic minority groups. And it is the one, it is the one place in the world now, the one place in the world where you have people of ethnic Chinese origin who are ruling in a democratic and liberal, liberal democratic fashion. And 
here you've got 1.4 billion people on the mainland who seek to uh, uh, to, to to change that that status quo. So it's it, it's a great source of concern for me. I have some friends in Taiwan as well, and I really wonder how we're gonna how we in the China, and and Beijing and Washington and Beijing are going to get get out of this. And just one more one more thing, uh, kind of an anecdote before I. I turn over the talking stick to you, Jay. In the past week or so, there was the visit of three U.S. senators to Taiwan for all of three hours. Three hours, okay. Senators Tammy Duckworth, uh, Chris Coons, and Dan Sullivan from Alaska, and they were on the ground there at the airport, Songshan Airport in Taipei, for about three hours. They were met by Tsai Ing-wen, who went to the airport as well as other dignitaries, and then they were transported in on a uh, U.S. Air Force C-17 transport. And this got a lot of press in China in terms of, of the insult that the Chinese people supposedly had that there was a military aircraft that landed in Taipei with three U.S. senators. So they just saw it as another slice of the salami that the Americans were changing the status quo of the strategic ambiguity and pushing closer and closer and closer and closer to that red line. Uh, well, my reaction is, uh, you know, at first, meaning what, gee, decades ago, after the war, we swore that we would protect Taiwan, gave them weapons, gave them money, made treaties, reserved, um, you know, alliances with them. And over time, you know, various administrations, that's a problem in, in our democracy, administrations come and go foreign policy comes and goes. Alliances come and go these days. And so our relationship with them isn't nearly as hardy as it used to be. And our promises to protect them are not as nearly as credible. Um, you can say it's ambiguous, but you know, even ambiguity, you can see through the ambiguity when you connect the dots. And I think if you connect the dots now and you ask whether the United States would defend Taiwan, against that attack, the answer is a, is, a, is a robust no, it would not. It would stand back and uh, maybe we would make some noise, but we don't have the political will. And of course, there's the other question is, uh, is China you know, going to tolerate our involvement or is it, is it going to be mm, fisticuffs with us too if we try to enter that theater? And I think the answer is China feels very strong and arrogant about this. That's why they can cut the salami this way. That's why they can go into the South China Sea. They don't care. They're going to they're going to have their way. And every day they're stronger about it because they're always testing us. And I think we fail the test. I, I think their Navy is stronger than our Navy. Um, I think they have all kinds of weapons and they have a huge army and it's very uh, what do you want to say? It's very responsive to the political commanders. Um, I don't. I don't think we can beat them there. Uh, it would be a disastrous war, but I don't think we can beat them. And at the end of the day, we we know that, as you said, all the scenarios point the wrong way. All the think tanks are telling us not to do that. So we are going to wind up being observers maybe stamping our feet, you know, I don't know, sanctions, all those things that have no effect on the, on the public stage, on the global stage. And, and I agree with you too, that this is coming. Uh, one, of the, one of the points in the article in Foreign Affairs uh, a week or two ago uh, was that she had said that within three to five years, he was gonna resolve this problem. That means he's gonna take over Taiwan in three to five years. Then he's, strengthened by what he did and is doing in Hong Kong. You know, Hong Kong is going to look like, uh, uh, you know, what's the name of that city in the West where the Muslims are? Xinjiang. Xinjiang, he, yeah. He's going, to have, he's going to have his cameras. He's going to be watching every man, woman, and child in the place. He's going to be throwing him in jail on, or retraining, if you will, on, on, on pretense. Uh, he is going to terrify them. And uh, this, this has the effect of terrifying others elsewhere, uh, like in Taiwan. He may threaten Taiwan to the point where they just give up. You know, that's a possibility. Straight, you know, uh, take economic steps um, and, and stamp his feet. 
um, and you know, use uh, threatening military operations, maneuvers, exercises to show cyber that attack, that, cyber, cyber attack, attack, quarantine, yeah, that, blockade. Yeah, yeah there are a number that. of options, and kind of. I, I, I wanted to read this this uh, quote from um, it was uh, in the New York Times piece by Keith Bradshaw, who's their China China bureau chief there, uh, and I found it kind of striking. This is from Xi Jinping last week when he was speaking before a uh, level, a top level a group of the Chinese Communist Party. And quote, we must focus on setting the tone right, be open and confident, but also modest and humble, and to strive to create a credible, lovable, and respectable image of China. I, I like that last phrase in particular, credible, lovable, and respectable image of China. And that it kind of an obvious question to me is, I mean, does he believe and do his his top lieutenants believe that they are currently uh, creating that credible and lovable image of China? You know, well, which, but it's propaganda. They're, they're creating a fantastic level of untrue propaganda. That's what's happening here. I mean, it, it, it actually reminds me of some of the things that Trump has done. Um, but bottom line is, uh, you, you can't believe what they say now. Uh, there was a time when you might have believed the greater share of it, but right now, no. Uh, they're, 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 they're abusive and they're mm, arrogant. So, um, I, I, you know, they can talk about being lovable, but they, nobody, nobody is going to believe that, I hope. Bottom line, though, is that we're going to be facing this increasingly, accelerating, the, uh, escalating problem over the next few years. And uh, they're going to be uh, taking advantage of any false steps that, uh, that, that happen with our government and our country. You know, they're probably rubbing their hands when they see insurrection and they see, uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden's inability to get his initiatives through because um, they can get their initiatives through, no problem. So, what, you know, what, what happens here is that they are encouraged um, by our mm, frustrations and failures. And that makes it happen faster. And when the crux moment comes, and I agree with you, it wouldn't necessarily be a physical war. It could be any number or a combination of things, as in the Foreign Affairs article. Um, we are not really in a position to stop them. We are not really in a position to get involved. We are not really in a position to change their conduct. And yet, Jay, and yet, despite the bluster, which is can be considerable at times, one of the things uh, that really has struck me in my years uh, in reading a lot of a lot of literature on China, both written by Chinese sources and Western sources, is the degree of kind of ingrained insecurity, fear, and paranoia that exists amongst Han Chinese. And there are reasons uh, and explanations for that that would be another hour or two or uh, of worth of discussion. But uh, it, it is, it is a, a firm conclusion and observation I have that there is kind of deep within, and I'm making a broad generalization here and I, I'll stand by it. Uh, there is a, as I said, deep, kind of river of insecurity, fear, and paranoia. Some of it justified based on how they were treated by uh, colonial powers, including the United States in their history. And some of it that I think springs just from the nature of being, again, I'm generalizing here, the being Chinese. And they cover it up at, at times with a lot of bravado, try very hard to cover it up with a lot of bravado. But to me, there is this deep insecurity within the psyche. And, you know, to circle back to, to close this, uh, this dance that we're doing with them in Taiwan is, is very, very dicey right now. And uh, just want to kind of sidebar note, uh, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company there in, in Taiwan is the kind of uh, uh, ultra uh, best and most sophisticated manufacturer of, of you know, the, the top chips in the world, the top computer chips in the world. It's a Taiwan semiconductor 
um, corporation. Manufacturing company, Man TSMC. T yeah, huge, uh, worth trillions. Uh, opening a opening a, a subsidiary plant in the U.S. by the way in Arizona. Arizona. Yep. Arizona. Yep. But that's going to uh, take. They're spending trillions there too. And imagine, I mean, and and I got this information from a good piece in sixty minutes a number of weeks ago by Leslie Stahl. And I mean, imagine I got to believe if I was a planner in Beijing that I would certainly be taking that into account in terms of uh, the benefits and the risks of of the mainland making a more uh, immediate or, or near term move into Taiwan is getting access and control over the premier manufacturer of chips, which, you know, have to do with military, have to do with IT, have to do with um, uh, AI and all other e sorts everything, of acronyms. Everything, everything. Yeah. He who controls yeah. the semiconductors now in this world controls everything. But, you know, just one, one comment about your uh, concern over their paranoia. Um, I think, you know, uh, one of the things that I've seen in my readings uh, is that is that there's a tremendous amount of internal propaganda going on. I mean, you spoke of, um, you know, these, these newspaper articles uh, in state-controlled press um, where they, you know, knock on Taiwan every day. Uh, and, and why do they do that? Well, I think they want to get public support. They want they want the Chinese people to be behind them. When Jay, they, they already have move. that. They already have that in spades. Uh, there, there is very, very small number of people in China, who, even if they were honest in the mainland, who would say, "Way well, we support what the Taiwanese are doing. We support the freedom that they have." It's just the opposite. The very large majority of people on the mainland have bought in to the narrative, which the Taiwanese are renegade province. They're spoiled. They're they're elitist and you know, they deserve what's coming to them. I'm, I'm again, generalizing, but I, I'm 100% behind what I just said. But, you know, one other question before we close, and I do have a closing question for you, but why? Why 24 million people, it's peanuts. Sure, they have a, a semiconductor plant, but why does China, why is China pushing on this even since the war? Um, what is it symbolic maybe? Because it doesn't mean that much, really, to China. China's been successful in Tibet, I think Mongolia, and other, other peripheral countries. Um, China, you know, has been successful, is being successful in Hong Kong, its initiatives. China, China is all the way down to Spain with its Belt and Road. So what do they need this little peanut island? It is both strategic and symbolic, Jay. Strategic is pretty easy to understand. Symbolically, the Communist Party won. They were victorious over the Kuomintang in, in October 1949. And as that was happening, you had the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek who fled to the island of Formosa, a.k.a. Taiwan. So symbolically, this represents the last part of the revolution, which they were unsuccessful ultimately because they didn't destroy and banish forever the Guomindang. The Guomindang escaped to the island. They're still there. You know, that party is still, interestingly, you know, go figure. The Guomindang or KMT, as it's known in Taiwan, is the opposition party to the Democratic Progressive Party. And they, go figure, they are more pro good, strong relations with the mainland. It's so interesting. Yeah. yeah, very funny how that works. So don't discount the symbolism, my friend, of how raw the Guomindang escaping to Taiwan and this renegade province being a thorn in their sides for decades. Don't don't underestimate Even how seven, so very 70 raw that years is. Later. No, 70 years later. 70 years later. I want to flip the question on you, though. Why? Why, if at all, is Taiwan important to us? And what, what, you know, what should we be doing now in our foreign policy to deal with this uh, you know, state of affairs? Well, let me answer that this way. So as much as I was not a fan of uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, uh, I do largely agree with his uh, then hardline, and he's still hardline, but then hardline attitude towards the People's Republic of China. And in the last weeks and months of the Trump administration, he instituted a number of changes to the status quo as far as American policy 
towards Taiwan. And there was a lot of bated breath on, on, in Beijing in terms of what's Biden going to do? Is he going to back off? Is he going to is he going to be more of our friend and a negotiating partner than Donald Trump was? And I think uh, they have to conclude at least six or so months into it that Biden and Tony Blinken, the current secretary of state, are not going to be soft on China. That is politically untenable, even if they wanted to. So the American position will continue to, I think, be relatively tough towards the China, uh, towards Beijing, uh, much to the dismay of, of Beijing. And, you know, what should we do differently? I think it's a very careful, very dangerous, carefully calibrated drama that we're in with Beijing right now. And I'm not in a position where I would recommend do this or do that. But, I, you know, I'm reading both sides. And like I said, to reiterate for the, the umpteenth time, I'm very, very concerned about uh, Beijing deciding at some point not too far from now that they've had enough. And it's time to deal with this once and for all, and the consequences be damned. Yeah, really, the reality is there, and all the, all that you read and see suggests exactly that. Well, Marco, you know, even though we can't solve this problem together, I, I would like to do that. Uh, we can certainly observe it, and I know that there'll be stuff happening, uh, you know, in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, and in Beijing. Um, that, that will teach us more about the trajectory of these historical developments. And I hope you'll join me again uh, when that happens, as and when that happens, so we can catch up and evaluate it still one more time. I'd be very pleased to do that, my friend. We know where to find each other. <laughs> Marco Mangelstorff, uh, a guy who has traveled everywhere, who has studied everything, and who has spent a lot of time in China and Southeast Asia. Really appreciate you coming around. Oh, shucks, Jay. You're too kind. Thanks so much for having me. Shay Shay, Tsai Jin. Shay Shay, Tsai Jin.